Kerry Statham. So I'm here in Bali and I'm from New Zealand, I'm not from Bali, I'm just living here at the moment. And um, this, this morning, having a scooter accident, it was like the, the, the remembering or the memories that came back of the last time I had a big accident was when I entered sobriety three and a half years ago. Mm. And since that moment, and you said the word surrender, like since that moment for me, I have just been surrendering, surrendering, surrendering to whatever I need to do to be the best me one day at a time. And I know that is so like, it can be so overused, just one day at a time, one day at a time. What does that mean? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And for me, it's literally like, if, if, if I can show up and do the absolute best that I can do with the knowledge that I've got, with the experience that I've got, with the, with the energy that I've got, then that is me showing up. Mm-hmm. You know, that, it is simple. I think sometimes we overcomplicate it of what does showing up mean. And as, as leaders, and for me, like for me, there's no other option. <laughs> for me, when we, when we enter sobriety and we go, okay, for me, I had another chance at life. So I was like, okay, I am alive. Like that in itself, I'm covering goosebumps right now, by the way. I, 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 for me, I don't have a choice, like, but in a beautiful way. Like I choose to not have a choice. I choose to, to surrender to showing up. You know, I'm not perfect. It's not perfect. But when things are going on and life is going on, when I realize that I get to choose how I see and perceive and interpret everything based on what I know currently. Hello and welcome to another exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine at recoverytodaymagazine.com where first and foremost, we're a magazine of hope. Whether you're considering addiction recovery for yourself or a loved one, or you're actively in recovery a short while or many years, you'll find information on all topics related to addiction, codependency, recovery, and living a happy, successful, sober life at Recovery Today. My name is Sherry Gaba. I am the editor of Recovery Today, and I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing another great guest today. Her name is Libby Wallace, and she is a leadership and wealth coach. She guides spiritual CEOs and leaders to align with their highest self and create a business and life of magnificent purpose, impact, and wealth, all while fulfilling their soul's work. Co-founder and host of a social initiative, the Self Wealth Project, as a way to give back to the community. Through charity events and a podcast, the Self Wealth Project leads others to live a truly wealthy life. And I'm so happy to have you here, Libby. I just love your energy. You're awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sherry, for having me and for your beautiful introduction. And like we said before, we hopped on the call for the beautiful work that you do in the world. It's truly, truly inspiring so thank you so much we are so blessed right because we both have a pod you know well you have a podcast i do the magazine and we get to meet the most incredible people and here i am talking to you in bali which is you know so awesome um and i thought it was kind of interesting because before we got on the call you'd had a little accident today Mm. and i thought that was interesting and i know you kind of had some in, you know awareness around it and of course i've got the end of bronchitis well probably the beginning of bronchitis the end of pneumonia And yet, you know, we're showing up. Here we are. So um, maybe we could talk about how do we show up for ourselves despite things that just happen in life, you know, like my dogs may bark or, you know, whatever else. We don't, we just never give up kind of thing, you know, Mm -hmm. and maybe we could call it, um, it's not, I mean, I want to say that it's, it's not really surrender, but we do surrender to our, ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, maybe you could talk about that for a minute. Mm, it's a, such a beautiful question and y- you're right like we do show up like we're, we're in these situations we're going through life we've got things happening and just touching on what Sherry said I'm, so I'm here in Bali and I'm from New Zealand I'm not from Bali I'm just living here at the moment and um this this morning having a scooter accident it was like the, the, the remembering or the memories that came back of the last time I had a big accident was when I entered sobriety three and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. And since that moment, and you said the word surrender, like since that moment for me, I have just been surrendering, surrendering, surrendering to whatever I need to do to be the best me one day at a time. And I know that is so like, it can be so overused, just one day at a time, one day at a time. What does that mean? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And for me, it's literally like if, if, if I can show up 
and do the absolute best that I can do with the knowledge that I've got, with the experience that I've got, with the, with the energy that I've got, then that is me showing up. Mm-hmm. You know, that, it is simple. I think sometimes we overcomplicate it of what does showing up mean. And as, as leaders, and for me, like for me, there's no other option. Right? For me, when we, when we enter sobriety and we go, okay, for me, I had another chance at life. So I was like, okay, I am alive. Like that in itself, I'm covering goosebumps right now, by the way. I, yeah. I, I, for me, I don't have a choice, like, but in a beautiful way. Like I choose to not have a choice. I choose to, to surrender to showing up. You know, I'm not perfect. It's not perfect. But when things are going on and life is going on, when I realize that I get to choose how I see and perceive and interpret everything based on what I know currently, then it's amazing. And I choose, I, it's a choice. It's always a choice. So I think that's what it comes down to. I love that. The gift of showing up and, and also being a part of the fact that you almost died. And it's funny because um, only recently I thought about this. I was premature. I was a 50-50 baby. I'm older than you. And in those days, they didn't allow mothers to, um, I was only three pounds and I was an incubator for three months. And I, you know, I was fed through my feet and had an oxygen mask on my nose. And it was a pretty grueling start in life. But it was, it was the fight flight, right? I started in a fight flight. And so if we take that fight flight like you did and turn it into positive work in the world, you know, after that, um, what happened to you three and a half years ago, which if you care to, you can discuss, um, you can harness the greatest joys for you and for countless others. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, that's what it comes down to. Like we all go through like, like your experience as well. Like it's not a pleasant experience, but I truly believe that when we come into this world, we are given experiences that are so freaking challenging, but we can, and it's it, that choice again we're sitting in fight or flight like as humans when we're born we we are ultimately sitting in fight or flight always we're surviving like you know looking out for what's what's going on but there comes a point where we go okay i can either keep living in fight or flight and survival and going okay poor me this has happened to me this is you know this is terrible this is so bad but what fun is that like life can so be so 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 incredible and i know like for many of you watching this if you're new to recovery or you're not yet in recovery and you're thinking about it you're like but how like it just sounds so toxically positive and it just sounds so cheesy Take it from me. It's a choice and it is a daily choice to show up and go, how can I turn this situation into the best thing possible? And for me, like this morning, having a scooter accident, I was so grateful that first of all, I was alive again, that it wasn't severe. And most importantly, that the work that I've done over the last three and a half years of showing up, of choosing to let every challenge be a positive experience, mm-hmm. that I literally came home. I, the best I went to the beach where I was heading to, got cleaned up. There were some cafes around and they helped me out. Came back home and my husband said, you know, we were talking. I said, oh, by the way, I had my first scooter accident. Not that I intend to have another one. And he was like, I am so proud of you for the shift that you have made. Because we reflected on the shifts that I have made over the last three and a half years Mm. of going, oh my gosh, like what's happening to me? What's going on? And like, what's going on in my life? To going, it happened. I'm here. Amazing. Life carries on. Yeah. well, so he, really, he noticed it. That's really interesting. Really noticed it. Yeah, really noticed and, it. And then I have to ask, as you were talking, because, you know, I unfortunately, and you as well, I'm sure we see a lot of relapse. And I want, and that was my ex-husband's story, a chronic relapse, or, and it continues to be that story. Mm-hmm. And I wonder from a soul's perspective, mm-hmm. why do you believe, I mean, I believe that perhaps they need to do some more work either maybe not here, maybe in another life, you know, maybe in a, you know, in their inf- in, in infinity or something like that. Mm-hmm. Why some relapse continually and others do not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do for me, yeah. For me, that's such a beautiful question and a really, it's like a really challenging thing to touch on and very, very sensitive. So I just want to set the intention that 
is I'm literally bringing things from my perspective and for anyone listening who's going through anything like this. And not to judge. I want to make sure I am not judging whatsoever. Not judging whatsoever. And it's really just going, okay, you know, if this is triggering, why is it triggering? And for me, <clears throat> the word that's coming up is like, I'm a bit of a sober rebel. I, I, I started out with, with AA and it's such a beautiful space. For me, it wasn't aligned. And I can't say why it wasn't aligned. It just wasn't aligned for me. And so I, I, was, I, I went through my sober journey very alone. Like my, I was very lucky that my husband decided to go sober with me as well. He was from a line of addiction. So having him, it was literally just the two of us. I think in that in itself. What I realized, and I had this, <laughs> an other moment of surrender you know this was like a second moment of surrender the first was in the hospital when I you know miraculously survived a, I'll, I'll say what it was it was like I miraculously survived a drunken suicide and I had I had fallen well I jumped off the second story and landed on concrete. and how I'm alive how I'm alive it's just like yeah I could cry with, with, with gratitude for being here right now and my second moment of surrender and realization, I was lying on the floor. I was about three months, three, I can't remember now if it was like three to six months sober. And I was just bawling my eyes. I was on a ball on the, fl on the floor, just crying and crying and crying and crying. And I had this, this knowing, this all knowing just washed through me because everything in me right then wanted to go and grab a bottle of wine. Like I tell you, like I, it was, if you, oh yeah, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So everything through me was going, okay, I have two options right now. I can feel this horrific feeling that I'm feeling that is causing me to curl up and bawl my eyes out like I've never cried before in my life on the floor in front of my then boyfriend, now husband. Mm -hmm on the floor, just like <laughs> incredibly messy, incredibly, incredibly messy. I can either do that or I can go and grab a bottle of wine. Those are my two options right now, right? I've always sort of known the, the power of choice. Right. In that moment, the knowing that washed through me, and this is the other surrender, was I can either, if I go and grab that bottle of wine, I am going to go back down the same path that I have just come from, all the work that I've just put in is going to mean nothing. And I'm going to have to come back in another life because there's no way that I'm going to survive in this life. Mm. I'm going to have to come back in another life and do the same things, <laughs> learn the same lessons, have the same experiences until I heal this addiction. So were and you so drinking, were you drinking <clears throat> all day? Were you drinking every night? Were you... <clears throat> No, so a couple of times a week, but once I had one, that was me. And I was at the point where I was having like one glass of wine and I would have blackout. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You really, quote, had the allergy per se or whatever. Yeah, 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 really. So in that moment of going, okay, here is my easy, here is my easy way out. Go and grab a bottle of wine, which is where people relapse. And I, 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 I totally wholeheartedly see how easy it is to relapse. So easy. But I think the difference is knowing that it's, it's okay to feel like shit. I hope I'm allowed to say that. It's okay. No, for to sure. <laughs> for sure. And in recovery, like, for me, I've, this is how rebellious I am in the sober world. <laughs> I've even changed the word recovery to discovery because for me, recovery felt really disempowering. I'm like, well, what am I recovering from? I, I started my addiction when I was 13. I don't want to go back to when my trauma started. Right. And so I thought, okay, well, if I look at this of discovering who I am, discovering what's underneath the surface, if I'm lying in bed at night and all of these traumatic memories are coming purpose then I'm going to heal them and I'm going to do whatever it takes to not die <laughs> like that for me was what it was mm -hmm. and having that knowing and so by healing the very traumas and this is hindsight that has taught me this by healing the very traumas that my addiction stemmed from I also healed myself from bulimia which I didn't even know I was bulimic. Mm. <laughs> I massive amounts of financial debt. 
because wow. I didn't realize that I'd been using money the same way that I've been using alcohol, the same way that I've been using drugs, the same way that I've been using sex and men and relationships and clothes <laughs> and all my, all the things, food, all the things. Yeah. So I totally, so for me, like when I see someone who has relapsed, it's not like you failed, not at all, not at all. It's almost like the trauma that you went through was so painful to relive in order to heal it. Cause that's what we got to do in order to heal it. We have, we have to re not relive it, but we got to go back to that time and, and learn to forgive, to love, to accept and to have compassion for the people involved, for yourself, and dealing with that shame, that remorse, that, 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 that challenging emotion, it is challenging. It is so challenging. So for me, that's what, I, like, that's what relapse is. It's just, it's so challenging that it's easier to go back down that path than to face that darkness. The hard stuff. I agree. And I, you know, you kind of remind me of what Gabar Mate talks about. I'm sure you've heard of him. He, he's amazing. He's a Canadian scientist. And if you haven't heard of him, you must check him out on YouTube. Gabar Mate, M-A-T-E. Oh, it's all about trauma and addiction. Libby, you will love him. And, you know, I, I've had him in the, ma I had him in the magazine. He was, the interview was incredible. He's incredible. Um, it's all about trauma and addiction. And you're so right because you know, the, the issue is that some people know that there was trauma, but they're not willing to go to the awareness of the trauma. Like, I remember when I met my ex and I knew he had a really traumatic childhood. It was like, I had the best childhood. I'm, I'm fine. Everything's fine. I had the, and I couldn't understand. He really could never go to that level. He knew. And then later he kind of understood there was trauma, but he didn't want to be aware of the trauma. So it sounds like what you're saying is you just dove deep, 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 deep. And were willing to do the work and knew that if you didn't, and you didn't, it's all a choice. I mean, when I hear the word disease, I say it's a disease when once you take the drink. I don't feel it's a disease until you take the drink. That is my opinion. Yeah. I'm sure I, many people will disagree with me when they hear this interview. But to yeah. me, you have a choice, like you said, until yeah. you take the drink or the drug or the sex or the guy or whatever. So I think we're on the same page. So yeah. you're a sober coach, I guess also a recovery. I mean, are you a sober coach in that you, you live with people to help them get sober or do you, are you a recovery coach in that you work with them to, it, through their journey of recovery? Because you know, there's two different types of coaches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's what I started my business doing. I don't do that anymore. I developed a program, the same thing that I went through for like three or hang on, two years to totally go, because I'm just, I'm just going to set the intention now. I'm at the place now where I, I don't want to drink. Like I, I don't even think about drinking. The thought of taking a drink actually repulses me. Um, I've just, I'm such a different person. And so I know like what I went through at the time was who am I to become a sober coach when I've only got two years sobriety and there's people out there with 20 years sobriety still got like still struggling, still yeah. struggling, still struggling. However, for me, I knew that it was part of my sole mission at that time to help people and I call it love yourself sober. And so for me, like being, when I started my first business as a sober coach, and I actually started from a blog. And I think because I've got such different views than a lot of the recovery world, <laughs> which is, you know, we might be setting ourselves up for like <laughs> lots of disagreements. Okay, I have many people on with many different paths. So you're, yeah. you're, you're in great company here at Recovery <laughs> Today. <laughs> so it's like, when, I, when, when people could see my perspective of, you know, yes, going through, going through your own steps, and it's not, it's not necessarily going to be one size fits all, and it, it never is. But the, I guess the things that I was sharing in my blog resonated with a lot of people. So literally people just started, I was working in the corporate world, people started messaging me being like, can you help me get sober? I don't resonate with AA, but I really resonate with your message. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll, and I literally just talk, and for me, like I'd always been in mentoring, leadership, management roles. So coaching and mentoring oh, okay. very natural to me, like in, my, in the corporate world. And so when I had this blog and people started to reach out to me, it was literally just like, I would jump on a call or jump on a, a Zoom call like we are right now and just have a conversation and ask, like asking questions of like, well, okay, what, you know, getting, for me, it was always about getting to the, the root of the issue. If people wanted to go there, then they, then they went there. And it was like, 
because I guess because I've been through it. So it was more the coaching side of it was more um, like like this, <laughs> like yeah, just talking. I understand. And, and that evolved into when I developed the program and a lot of people started going through the program and going, oh my gosh, this works. I even don't want to drink now. Like for, for me, I get messages from people even though I've like the program is something that I still offer. I don't work one-on-one -on -one with people anymore through this. Oh, I still okay. From people going, you've helped me so much give up drinking and not even want to drink and choose a different way of life. Got and it. they haven't even necessarily got an addiction or an alcohol problem, but they know it's not serving them anymore. Yeah. And yeah. So that's, that was, so it's, um, so it's like a video program or, a, or something like that where you yeah, video. It's an online course. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I love it. I'm so all about that. And yeah. I love that. And I think it's possible. And I think people are really learning in different ways today. They don't necessarily, I mean, I am a one-on-one -on -one therapist and I have, mm -hmm. you know, a full practice, but I believe that um, I've always loved groups. I love, you know, and I think that, that some of us are just meant to do that. We're meant to do more. Um, I don't want to say bigger because I think everything's important one-on-one -on -one and groups and online courses, but some of us are just meant like yourself to reach a, a a larger audience um yeah. so because so now i guess i have the answer the the getting into the uh leadership coaching or executive coaching or mm -hmm. or abundance coaching is that because that's kind of where your other career sort of you know went you know kind of they met you know so you know they all kind of met yeah so what and what happened what was really interesting is so my background was like i was always in the travel and tourism and education industry so like um sales and leadership and management and um that was my past life <laughs> yeah but they party too much so when I got sober I was like I can't be in the party industry still and so for me when I started my business only like 18 months ago and it's just what I learned was that as, as I was teaching people how to love themselves sober I was because I've got a degree in psychology as well so I was using that as well as like my coaching and mentoring and leadership experience and what I realized is when people started to love themselves sober and the results that I started seeing in the people I was working with was that they started discovering their life purpose. They started creating more happiness and statistically proven happier people make more money. And so they also started creating like their own soul businesses. They started creating more money. They started like all of wow. these crazy things that I did not expect from choosing to live a sober life and teaching people how I had done it and how they can do it as well. And so I realized that my, I, I truly believe that whenever we're in our, like doing our soul's work and in soul business, as we evolve on a soul level and as humans and, and, and mature into our life experience, so does the work that we do in the world. And so the natural evolution of my my progression has meant that my business evolved from just teaching people how to love themselves sober. I shouldn't say just teaching people how to love themselves sober to actually teaching them how to create the wealthiest life and business possible. And so that's sort of like the, in a nutshell, the evolution of it. That's um, interesting. I, you know, I love that. And I, you know, I think one of the issues, though, for a lot of people, not just necessarily addicts or alcoholics or codependents, mm -hmm. maybe codependents, is that asking for what you're worth. I know as a, you know, my degree is in social work, but I'm a therapist, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's always been very difficult for me to ask for what I'm worth. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like of people that get sober, you know, they, they have that shame and they have that past and they have all that stuff. And I'm wondering, like, how do you help them break through to realize that they are worthy, you know, because it's, it's, it's really old scripting. I mean, it's, it, for me, it was, you know, growing up with money issues and I could go on and on. And so, and then, oh, I became a social worker to heal the world. So I think a lot of healers, light workers, these kind of people have trouble stepping into asking for what they're worth. Yeah. Yeah. That's a massive component of what I teach now as well. Cause that like, from Love Yourself Sober, I then created this beautiful, I, I always say like I channeled it, like I, I would love to claim it, but it's almost like I just get these ideas downloaded. I'm like, okay, that's what I'm doing. Like that's what's coming into the world now, where I teach people how to discover their soul purpose. Like once they, they don't necessarily have to be sober, but most of the people I work with end up actually choosing a sober life 
because of the, the beautiful benefits that it has for the, on a spiritual level, on a leadership level, on a, you know, creating wealth level, like all of these different things. Um, so teaching people how to find their purpose and actually in doing that, they, a massive part of what I teach is how to heal your relationship with yourself to create the worthiness that you want or that you, that you know that you are worthy of and being it and rewriting your money story. I'm going like this because it's a triangle that I always work with. It's like discovering your purpose, rewriting your money story, because like as long as we're struggling with money, in this world, we are sitting in survival. Like if we don't know how we're going to pay our bills, if we don't know how we're going to earn money, we're sitting in survival. And so when we're sitting in survival, we're predominantly using our central nervous system, which is blocking our ability to receive deeper abundance. Yeah. So when we step into this worthiness and rewriting our abundance stories, our money stories, and really see how incredibly magnificent we truly are as humans, when we discover our purpose, it's almost like this, this veil that society has accidentally placed on us throughout our lives is released. And it's like we, we go back to that, that soul knowing, that deep knowing, like you are human and you are so incredibly worthy. And it's not the, you know, if, if you were to count all the hours of experience and the dollars you've spent on your own education, let alone the intangible transformations that you have been through to be able to hold space for people like you do and see that massive not only results in their life but in their families and the people at their workplace yeah, like i do i i think there's an ancestral dna component because of coming from lack and um you know i, I had another thought about this and it just kind of went past me but it had to do with this abundance uh, and lack mentality and, and how to work through it. And what you're saying is you have to get out of your trauma or your survival state in order to be able to see the worthiness. So I, I really like that because what it's really true. Fight or flight is a blockage. So, you know, um, but, you know, I don't know. It's still, it's still tough because I've done a lot of work around trauma and there's still like that. And I'm not quite sure what it is. I, I, could be an old money story. Could I think it could be even deeper in ancestral DNA. I mean, this is kind of woo-woo and sorry, everybody, if people don't get it. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> I do think that those blocks sometimes, you know, we have these like contracts of, in other lifetimes. And so I'm sure part of what your work is helping them break these. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like and we, we always carry like seven generations of both of our, both of our parents DNA. And so in fact, I literally just had a session with my mentor the other day to totally rewire deeper stuff that I like, we're always going to be doing the work. Like as we're on this journey, we're always going to be digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah. And it's exactly that. It's, it's, it's rewriting how you view money, the energy of money, what it is, what it means to you. But more importantly, like the life that you're able to create once you step into it, it's a, yeah, there's a, so many different facets of money in itself because of the taboo that it's got on a societal level, let alone right. like an ancestral and a personal level. There's like lots of different elements that are, yeah. I, I totally agree. And I, and I love the fact that you are putting the two together. You're you know, connecting the dots because I do think a lot of shame is involved for addicts, alcoholics because of their past and being able to forgive themselves and, and stepping into their worthiness. I think it's just a, you know, it, it sounds cliche, but it really is important in order to receive. And that's a big one too. I love what you said about being able to receive. Um, anyway, I love it. I love what you're doing and I, I, I'm glad we touched on it. So maybe just a couple of tools or lessons that somebody might be able to take away. I mean, we're not done yet, but that you've used with your clients or that have helped you, you know, just maybe something simple that they can have as a takeaway. Yeah, I think the most powerful tools at any point of our journey, whether we're in sobriety or not, or in our own business or not, that I still use, and I have used them from the very moment that I got sober, is forgiveness yeah. and gratitude. And they sound really simple, and they are, but they're not easy. <laughs> And so when we can truly forgive ourselves 
to release any shame and guilt that we carry, when we can forgive others and truly see the very people who have caused us the most harm from a place of forgiveness. It doesn't mean we have to like them, but actually see them from a space of compassion. There is so much power in that. So much power. Oh, in so much. Yeah. And then we choose it, and that's choosing, choosing forgiveness, and then choosing to be grateful for the very things that have been our deepest life challenges, and going about our days. I, honestly, those two tools still to this day are the, the, the I like <laughs> attribute a lot of my growth to those two very things. It's Great. absolutely freeing. It's absolutely freeing. Yeah. I mean, I spoke to a medium a while ago, and. I'm not going to go into the details, but there was somebody I just was having, it wasn't my ex, but it was someone I was having a really hard time forgiving for the pain that he was causing my family. Mm -hmm. And I swear to God, when he said, send him love and light, it will ricochet back to, I forget how he said it, but the love will ricochet back to you. Um, I don't know what he said that would, what would happen to him. I don't think he meant any harm to him, but for some reason, when I started that exercise of ricocheting the love towards him, this person that had hurt my family so deeply, it was like, it was like a release. It was like total freedom. Yeah. So I agree with you. Yeah, it so is. And I'm just going to speak into that just really quickly if we've got time. That sometimes, and I think what people see is how can you be grateful when you're going through all of this shit? Like how can you be so grateful? Yeah. And again, it's, it's up to the choice, but there's a difference between surface level gratitude and full embodiment. And so when, when you're going through massive, um, situations and you've got challenges it's addressing each emotion as it is processing that emotion i'm such a believer that our, our emotions are stored in our body so even if we can do things like exercise and release release the stored emotion and actually shift it well, you know if you're angry at someone go do a boxing class put on some music and stomp around the house and punch it's all about it energy it's energy movement energy movement i totally agree with you it totally is and and then come back to gratitude. Like I think there's a massive dis disconnection between like just be gratitude and ignore your emotions. No, no, <laughs> deal right. with your emotions and then back to gratitude. Oh God, yes, it's exactly. You don't want to be Pollyannish about it and say, oh, just feel your feelings, just be gratitude. You know, that's not that is not. No, no, you have to actually identify absolutely and and um, have an awareness of it. And and I think it's because people have trouble living in all or that ever alcoholics especially very all or nothing so it's about both it's like i really was hurt by this person and i can have gratitude like yeah. we can have both you know so i i love that and i don't know if you do you know melody Beatty's work codependent no more yeah. so she's wonderful i know you're not in this country but so maybe that's part of it but she is like the mother of codependency and her name is melody Beatty. she wrote the book codependent no more and she's a very dear friend of mine and she taught me um this idea of <laughs> having gratitude for the things you're not grateful for and why they're blessings. Because if you really review your life, you will see that the, some of the worst things that have happened to you have made you the best person, the high, have made you the highest version of yourself. You yeah. don't know it while you're going through it and you, you can't, but so. Yes, yeah. 100%. Uh, yeah, I um, just wanna see what else we were gonna talk about today. I get, I love this idea of what it means that our inner world, because it kind of reminds me of the law of attraction, um, mm -hmm. what it means that our inner world creates our outer world and how it's possible for everyone to create their best life through sobriety. So mm -hmm. again, you know, I think we have to be congruent from what's going on in and what's going on on the outside. And so mm -hmm. maybe talk to that and then how somebody can embrace that more often, like how you really feel and receive it and also speak it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I feel like, and it's, all, it's such a beautiful thing to be talking about because we've literally just like set the foundation for that like out the outer world so whatever we're experiencing like I look up I'd like I'm just I'm living in Bali right now and I wake up in the morning and I pinch myself and I'm saying this not to like show off or anything but it was not that long ago that I was living in a place I didn't like I was waking up stressed every single morning um, you know, in the early days of recovery, I was looking around, I was like, what am I doing? What is this life? And this realization that, that when I was learning to love myself sober, and this is like, I, I accidentally discovered all of these like theories and tips and techniques and stuff. So w when we start, when we look around at the world outside of us, again, it's what, whatever we are seeing 
is because of what's in here. So if we are constantly seeing drama or, um, you know, these are not nice things playing out around us or, you know, we, we're focusing on this debt that we might be in or anything like that, it's a direct reflection. I know this hurts sometimes to hear it and it certainly did for me as I was like, ooh, it's a direct reflection of what's going on in here. And so when we truly step into a life of self-love and not like bubble baths and like, you know, washing our hair, self-love, but actually <laughs> dealing with our shit and learning, learning to forgive and learning gratitude, those two simple things and actually look at ourselves from a place of such deep compassion that we, that we honor what we need in our life, whether it is to remove people that are doing us harm, whether it is to remove whatever, whatever it is, when we start to love ourselves truly and wholeheartedly, and sometimes it's tough love, that self-tough love, self love, our external world really starts to shift. At first, it's only going to be a at first, it's going to be like, what am I doing all this work for? I can't see any results. I can't see a better life. <laughs> it's a load of shit. Like what a lot of people do. They go, I've been doing it too long. No, I'm, I'm done. I'm going back. But when we truly, truly keep at it and have faith, and I know that's a really challenging concept, to have faith that whatever we are doing to forgive, to love ourselves, to heal our shame, our guilt, our remorse, and truly come from this heart-centered place for ourselves first and see ourselves as the wonderful, you know, beings that we are, our outer world is going to start to shift slowly, 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 but it's going to speed up, speed up, speed up the more that we do it. Exactly. Exactly. And I think also, as you said that I was thinking about today was a really bad stock market day. And I know that like, many people will take that outside stuff and allow that to affect their inside. I did. I freaked out. I called my stockbroker. And then I realized that's just noise. That is just noise. And it's just like paper and it will shift and everything shifts. I don't know. But, you know, I guess that would bring me to the next question for you. Maybe we can close here is what is your best advice for someone who does live in, in chronic fear, you know, mm. chronic Free, fro, you know, frozen states. I mean, mm. some of them can get out of it, like I did today. I, you know, I was, I was in it, and then I went up, and then I was out of it. But some people say stuck in it, and then they end up self-medicating over it. Mm -hmm. So, what is your greatest tip for getting out of fear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's such an amazing question, and so many of us, like I used to as well, every day was in fear. It was in, it was in how am I going to survive today? What's going on with this life? What is this? What is the point of this life? Like right. I, I remember living like that. And one piece of like one piece of advice, I feel like there are so many, so many different elements to it. First of all, is to actually address the fear. And I th the thing about fear is that we, we try not to think about it and it actually gets bigger and louder and noisier. And we just try and like, I think positively and pretend it's not there or it's, all consuming and we self-medicate and we just can't can't deal with it i think the biggest thing is when we address it for me journaling is like writing down okay this is what i'm afraid of right now this is what i'm afraid of and how can i like what would be the worst thing that would happen if this was happen would happen and actually going okay what's the worst thing about what that what's the worst thing about that what's the worst thing about that and then what if i flipped it so for example i'm going to use like for me the biggest fears that i still have is going on an airplane Right, every time that I travel, hilarious for an ex travel agent, but anyway, every time I go on an airplane, I, I'm often just going, Okay, uh, the anxiety is so real, it's so loud, I just want to just not be here. They, it's, it's all consuming. Yeah, so I take myself to there's a couple of things, and I'll talk you through the different things that I, that I do. Um, and you can sort of hopefully put this on something that might be really worrying you right now. Or, that, or, or very fearful, and I go, okay, what's the worst thing? Well, what am I feeling? Okay, I'm feeling anxious. Why am I feeling anxious? Because I'm in the air, and I don't know how the airplane is moving like this when it's not on the ground. Okay, what's the worst thing that could happen? Plane could crash, and I could die. Okay, what's the worst thing about that? Well, I wouldn't be here anymore. Okay, what's the worst thing about that? 
oh, okay, well, my friends are, you know, something, and okay, well, that's like, however, it is what it is, and I'm not able to change it. So I get to this point where I go, okay, well, I can either keep going like this, or what if I arrive? What if I arrive and it's the most amazing experience? What if I get to my destination and it's so incredible and I have the best time ever? What if, you know, and so I start going down these paths. So, but I think what we do is we try and do this, but this is so loud that it, it's consuming. But if we actually do so funny, that, right? We always go to the negative. Uh, not always, yeah. but our brain, you know, instead of looking at the infinite possibilities of this amazing destination, we go right to, oh my God, what it's, it's so fascinating. My daughter and my granddaughter are going to be getting on a plane in th for Thanksgiving to go visit her dad and her other grandfather. And I'm like, ah. and yeah. it's sort of saying, oh my God, my daughter's going to have the most wonderful Thanksgiving with her other family. And how great is that? But our, our brains just, and you know, I think it's the noise too. I think yeah. it's, we have to like really not receive all the noise that's out there all the time. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Exactly. This is amazing, Libby. I, I have to, um, I have to just say thank you. You are amazing. And um, I want to make sure people can find you. So tell me like the best way to get a hold of you for our listeners. Mm -hmm. and viewers. So um, I love receiving emails off my website. That's always really fun. So LibbyWallace.com and on Instagram, I've recently just shifted, I've gone through like a big new identity shift. So, so okay. I'm like out with the old Instagram, my new one is at the spiritual CEO underscore Libby and on Facebook as well, Libby Wallace. Oh, that's such a great name. I love it. And underneath it says Libby Wallace. It says spiritual. Oh, I love that. That's perfect. Um, and then what about their, well, I guess their sober, the sober course that might mm -hmm. be of interest to many people that just would be at LibbyWallace.com. Love yourself sober. Yeah. I would love to be able to support anyone that needs it. Um, even if you just shoot me an email and, or a message and we'll go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for making yourself available and um, thank you for what you're doing in the world. And uh, you're just a, just a joy. And I'm really grateful you did this interview today and, and feel better with your accident. I know you already are feeling better, but be careful out there on that scooter. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me Sherry. It's been such an amazing conversation. And I, yeah, yeah. thank you to everyone who was watching and listening. It's uh, really amazing. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. Thank you.